Okay, hola, why not? We're back. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about something that's pretty important. Hoy hablaremos de algo realmente importante. And when Emma says pretty important, she pretty much means our lives depend on it. That's right. Today, we're going to talk about water, agua. Water is essential for life. El agua es esencial para la vida, and it never stops its journey in, on, and around the Earth on the... the water cycle! Behold! The water cycle. Part bicycle, part water delivery system. Hydration and transportation. Part ocean, part motion. <laughs> the water cycle. Uh, that's not exactly the water cycle we're gonna be talking about. It's pretty cool though, Joey. Thanks, what can I say? I like water. Well, that's because water's wonderful. El agua tiene un ciclo vital que nunca para. Our bodies are made up of almost 60% water. And about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. Pero la mayoría es agua salada, y solo cerca del 2.5% es agua dulce. And of that fresh water, only about 1% of it is accessible. The rest is locked up in glaciers, ice caps, or is underground. Water is the only substance on Earth that can naturally exist in three states of matter. El agua puede existir en tres estados de la materia. Those three states are solid, sólido, which we call ice, hielo, a gas, which we call steam, or water vapor, vapor de agua. And of course, a liquid, líquido, which we call water, agua. And here's something even more amazing. Water in its solid form, ice, is actually less dense than water as a liquid. That's very unique. Because ice is less dense than liquid water, it floats. This is good news for lakes and rivers. If ice sank, whole bodies of water could freeze from the bottom up. Si el hielo se hundieran, cuerpos de agua enteros podrían congelarse. That would not be good for all of the organisms living in or near the lakes or rivers. Water changing between these three states of matter is part of... The water cycle! Hey, that's my water cycle. Really, again, not that water cycle. The water cycle we're talking about deals with the fact that the water on the Earth is continuously moving on and above the surface of the Earth. It's how water around the globe moves through all three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. The water cycle takes place everywhere, all the time. Thermal energy from the sun causes the water at the surface to turn from a liquid into a gas. La energía térmica del sol hace que el agua en la superficie se convierta en vapor. And that brings us to the first of the three big shuns of the water cycle. Big shuns? Yeah, the shuns of the water cycle. Evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Evaporación, condensación, y precipitación. Oh, oh, the shuns! Evaporate, shun, condense, shun, precipitate, shun. Okay, I like that. What Emma just described is evaporation, water changing from liquid to water vapor. La evaporación es cuando el agua se transforma de líquido a vapor. So, in the water cycle, the water vapor starts to rise from the ocean into the atmosphere. As it travels higher into the atmosphere, the temperature drops and the water vapor condenses. Which brings us to our second big shunt, condensation, condensación. This is the process of water changing from a gas to a liquid. La condensación causa el rocío de la mañana en el pasto o un espejo humeante cuando te bañas. Those little beads of water on the outside of a glass of ice water? That's condensation too. Y la condensación como parte del ciclo del agua forma a las nubes. Some clouds can produce rain, which, spoiler alert, is the next shun, precipitation. Precipitación. That's right. When enough water droplets gather together and a cloud becomes heavy, the conditions are right to produce precipitation. Precipitation is water falling from the clouds. La precipitación también puede ser nieve o granizo. In the water cycle, one raindrop falling from the sky can go a lot of places. Say a drop lands on the top of a hill. 
Las gotas de lluvia pueden hundirse en el suelo y guardarse como agua subterránea o ser absorbidas por las plantas. Or gravity could pull it downhill. This is what's known as runoff. Then it could flow down into a river or lake where water accumulates. Exacto. Y el río podría llevar el goteo hasta el océano y luego podría evaporarse y subir a la atmósfera nuevamente. And eventually evaporate back into the atmosphere and start the whole journey over again. Every drop may take a different path, but they are all part of the water cycle. Simple, isn't it? Well, maybe not so simple. But don't worry. Adriana Bailey, an atmospheric scientist, is here to help us learn more. Hi, Dr. Bailey. We're so glad to have you here today. And we're glad to learn more about the atmosphere. Speaking of atmosphere, what do atmospheric scientists do? Sure. Well, atmospheric scientists study the atmosphere in all sorts of different ways. For example, some of us look at the way the air moves around. And in particular, I'm interested in how those air motions actually move water around. Other types of atmospheric scientists are interested in air pollution or interested in how specific storms form, like tornadoes or thunderstorms. How is the water cycle connected to climate? If you think about climate change, a lot of those changes we're going to experience through the water cycle, through things like changing precipitation patterns or changing intensity of storms, more flood, more drought. There's also an interesting point that the water cycle itself also affects how quickly the planet warms in response to greenhouse gas pollution. And that's because water vapor itself is a really important greenhouse gas. So if you put greenhouse gas pollutants like carbon dioxide into the air and warm that air up, it can actually hold more moisture and that moisture then has another warming effect. ¿Cuál es su parte favorita de su trabajo? What is your favorite part of your job? I get to ask lots of questions about how the world works and figure out ways to answer them. That's definitely my favorite part. Any advice for kids like us who want to become scientists one day? Yeah, I would say two things. One is, you know, don't get dissuaded by what you don't know. In fact, take what you don't know and use that as inspiration to ask questions and figure out how to find the answers to those questions. And secondly, I'd say don't shy away from the hard problems. I think the hard problems are really the more fun ones. The easy ones can definitely be too boring. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. It was so fun to learn about the atmosphere. Thanks so much, Why Nots. It was great to be here today. I think we need a brain break from this conversation. Conversation, another shun. Um, Mateo, I think we need to recognize that there are a lot of shuns in math and science. Addition, subtraction, adaptation. Okay, okay, lots of shuns. When we return, we're going to visit the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center to learn more about water. Al regresar, aprenderemos más sobre el agua. This is Why Not One requesting permission for takeoff. Why not one, you Fire up the ignition. And engage navigation. Vamonos. All right, no more shun jokes. We've made like a million already. Or is that an exaggeration? <laughs> <gasps> All right, everyone. We're flying to the John Booker Sands Wetland Center in Seagaville which is a quick trip southeast of the Perot Museum. The center is located in the middle of about 2,000 acres of man-made wetland habitat. It is absolutely beautiful out here. Wetlands improve water quality, provide a home for many different kinds of plants and animals, and help reduce flooding and erosion. Hey, Why Nots, we're here at the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center, and joining us today is John DeFilippo, director of the Wetland Center. Excited y'all are here today to learn about wetlands and conservation. ¿Por qué son importantes los humedales? Why are the wetlands important? Wetlands are amazingly important for wildlife, especially migratory birds that pass overhead every year. But wetlands also serve a purpose to filter water and provide nurseries and habitat for scores of other wildlife. 
Wetlands help to recycle. How deep is the water and how are the wetlands different from the lake? Wetlands, if you can imagine, are just shallow areas of land that are covered in about 18 inches of water. We always joke, if you're under the boardwalk and you fall in, just stand up. <laughs> so they differ quite a bit from lakes because lakes and ponds are much deeper. So deep that the sunlight cannot penetrate all the way to the bottom of the substrate. In wetlands, sunlight can filter all the way to the bottom and makes wetland plants grow even better. Where does the water from the wetlands come from and where does it go? Just north of us, the water is pumped in off the east fork of the Trinity River. And most of that water has been recycled at a wastewater treatment plant. And what leaves behind is phosphate, nitrate, and ammonia. And that water eventually is pumped into this wetland. And over seven to 10 days, the water flows all through about 20 different species of plants. And each plant pulls up that nitrate, that phosphate, and ammonia, and filters the water just by using nature. And after seven to 10 days, the water is pumped from here all the way underground, 43 miles back to the reservoir where it started. And that water goes back into the cycle and is used again. What is your favorite part of your job? Right now, interacting with students and teachers here at the John Bucker Sands Wetland Center is the best part that I can share about conservation and I can teach you something that you can bring back to your family and your friends and teach them as well. Because I hope a student creates the next best solution when it comes to water conservation. Any of us for kids who would like to work at a place like the Wetland Center? Oh, that's a great question. Volunteer, anybody can volunteer. The more that you can volunteer and learn in any field is very important before you even decide what you're gonna study in school. Thanks, John. I appreciate water even more now. It is so important to take care of the small amount of fresh water available to us. Thank you for being here. Water conservation is not just for us, but also for all the other animals and plants that need fresh water to survive too. The water cycle we described before shows the movement of water on, over, and within the earth. But there's another water cycle we should learn about, the urban water cycle. The urban water cycle describes how the water we use flows through our cities and towns. El agua que usamos viene de fuentes de agua superficial, lagos, ríos, y reservas. Some examples here in the Dallas area include White Rock Lake, Lake Levon, and the Trinity River. We can also use wells, pozos, to extract groundwater, agua subterránea, water that is found under the surface of the earth. El agua, antes de llegar a nuestros hogares, pasa por un sistema de tratamiento para eliminar los contaminantes o microorganismos dañinos. From the treatment plant, it is distributed through a system of pipes, pumps, valves, and storage vessels. The water flows from water towers into our homes so we can brush our teeth, drink, shower, water our lawns, and brush our teeth again at night. Brush those teeth twice a day, that's the way. Anyway, after we've used the water, it goes down the drain. And from there, it is collected and treated so it can be reintroduced into our environment again. A rainwater runoff from cities may enter the wetlands where water is filtered naturally. Exacto. Puede llegar a humedales como este y cualquier materia sólida se deposita sobre esas cuencas de sedimentación. Then, the wetland plants and soils filter out impurities, improving the water quality even more. At that point, the water is safe to be returned to nearby reservoirs. And that's the urban water cycle. This place is awesome, but it reminds me of something that I want to show you back at the Pro Museum. What do you say we head back there now? Vámonos! Check it out, everyone. The Pro Museum roof is its own water recycling system. El Museo Perú tiene su propio sistema de reciclaje de agua. The roof is equipped with its own rainwater catch and filtration system. Rainwater that falls on the roof and water from the air conditioning systems is funneled into one of two giant tanks. The museum can then use this reclaimed water for up to 100% of its landscaping needs and about 75% of its flushing needs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did it, why not? We covered the wonders of water and the water cycle. Should we do the one that's pop quiz right here? Let's do it. What is the water cycle? The water cycle is the continuous movement of water on and above the earth and all processes involved. El ciclo del agua es el movimiento continuo del agua en la tierra y todos los procesos involucrados. Emma, what type of energy drives the water cycle? 
thermal energy from the sun. Así es. La energía térmica del sol es lo que mueve el ciclo del agua. Okay, Joey, this one's for you. What are some of the shuns of the water cycle? Evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Sí, evaporación, condensación, y precipitación. What is the urban water cycle? That's the journey of water through lakes and reservoirs, through treatment, into our homes, through treatment again, and then back out again to be reclaimed for further use. Great job, everyone. I could really use a big glass of lemonade. I, I was gonna actually say a big glass of water, but <laughs> lemonade, it, um, it, absolutely. I mean, it's made out of water. Remember, if you love water as much as we do, you can become a scientist who studies the water cycle, like Dr. Bailey, or work at a place like the Wetland Center. All you have to do is ask why. And why not? <laughs> Porque no. Cheers, salud. Here's to the water cycle.